Action! Something to see him. Walker thing just But like the oh. that was a chore. I got a year and a half goes by. Bench and then spin around. Uh, and then dig in. <laughs> and make sure you are looking at it. Yeah, and then he does this start coming. And then he does it. Alright, so just a quick recap, we start out some I want the claw actually to already start. As a vampire. I came up with the idea for the Monster Project back in 2012 or 2013, so a long time ago. You're good. It's professional, yeah? Yeah, that's, that's good. Hi, my name is Victor Matthew and I'm the director of the Monster Project. I had just become basically best friends with Phil and uh, we were looking for a project to work on at the time, a feature film to make, or our first feature film to make, and I had quite a few feature film ideas, scripts I had written, and they were just too expensive for us to make. So I was thinking of a cheaper feature that, uh, you know, ideas for a cheaper fe feature that we could make, and I came up with the idea behind the Monster Project. Almost sunset. When I met Phil, uh, who obviously is the editor and DP and uh, producer on the Monster Project, he happened to live with an actor whose name was Brian and a writer called Shariah. This is where the team behind the Monster Project started unifying. Uh, we just had this core team of writer, actor, DP, and director. Is this Phil setting up a light for the interview? Yeah, well, can't do it all in the dark. Oh. This is Brian smoking a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> this is the very clean apartment that <laughs> Phil owns. Completely clean. We, we do our job. So the very first thing that Phil and I did when we came up with the idea is we went out to a store and we bought camera tape. And we wrote the Monster Project on it, slapped it on top of Phil's camera, and started filming each other uh, improvising with Brian, who was going to be the lead at the time of uh, the film. Damn it, that's why I'm not a cameraman, because I can't figure out the focus, there we go. Within the first day of shooting, we had our first spec trailer. And that was when we realized, hey, we can do this. We did this for nothing. So let's uh, see what we can do next. So I started reaching out to some actors that I was close with from uh, an interactive play that I had been working on for a couple of years uh, called Delusion. And uh, so Stephen Flores, who plays the Skinwalker, Natalie Garcia, who was originally slated to play uh, the vampire, and Shiori Detta, who played the demon. We cut together this short little video um, that was kind of like a teaser uh, that we started presenting to some companies uh, for investment. In the meantime, we also started a Kickstarter. There we go. Twenty thousand. Happy Kickstarter! Happy Kickstarter, boy! Woo! Woo! <laughs> Are you recording? Already? Yeah. Oh, get in on this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we had all these note cards, and so we were writing, you know, this is the method that I use when I write, is we were writing scene by scene on each note card, and we were mapping them out on Phil's wall. 
and uh, then after that we wrote the script he had very like the visuals he knew everything he wanted to do and i think that he had a lot of the plot um and i helped develop it with him and we we were sat drinking for like three days straight watching youtube videos um reading articles anything we could find about monsters um deciding because victor already knew what monsters he wanted in the movie he's like i gotta have skinwalker i love vampires they're you know super scary so when i first wrote the monster project with shariah uh, <laughs> the characters were named phil brian victor everybody was going to play their characters with their own names when we started doing casting we we're open to just about anything. Uh, we were looking for just anybody that was very good at improv and uh, who captured the essence of the roles. And for Phil's character, uh, we ran into someone called Jamal Quazer, who uh, ended up bringing this comedy into the character that we had never really thought of for the Moss Project. So originally, I guess it was going to be a rather serious, serious film. And, uh, and he came in and brought this life that really wasn't a part of the script and and it, I remember just being on the floor laughing and I couldn't control myself uh, when, when he was auditioning for us and we kept re-watching his audition tape again and again and again and it was for me an instant hire and uh, so the day we met Jamal is the day we cast him. Right. Brian, you never touch a driver's stereo. Everyone knows that. Look, that's not a toy. Yo, relax, man. I got it. Brian, would you put it down? Relax. I was so beyond excited when I had found Jamal as an actor. Uh, and I think Ryan Surratt, who was playing, uh, going to play Devin originally at the time, I was so excited about these actors because they were all so phenomenal that I had decided to kind of invite Ryan over um, kind of as a surprise and just tell him that we're going to work on the script together and just kind of do some rehearsal. So I invited Ryan over to Phil's place. And uh, I told him when he got here, I'm coming down. And instead of me, who came down, it was Jamal with a camera. And Jamal started kind of improvising with Ryan um, as we were coming up the elevator. And we basically filmed the first 20 pages of the film as a rehearsal, as an improvised and unexpected re uh, rehearsal for some of the actors in Phil's apartment. And it turned out actually really phenomenal. Uh, um, and we were really surprised and we just that's when we knew that the film was going to be something special and also that it was going to feel real with the actors that we had it was just we were just so excited and it just felt right it felt like we were going down the right path and um, that we were really going to create something that was really going to be amazing <laughs> oh man Yo. Death, man. Yeah, you should have seen the look on your face. And don't worry, you will. Because I got it all on tape. <laughs> of course you do. You already know. Wake your ass up, man. Here we go. Oh, there there we is. go. Billy <laughs> Phil for Ruby. <laughs> The man of the hour. What's up, Devin? Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. Are you doing Yeah, I am. used to zoom on me. I want to look good. Oh, yeah. Oh, All up in your grill. <laughs> the Monster Project became legitimate the day that I was introduced to Jim and that Jim basically accepted to do special effects for the film. I became involved with the Monster Project because John Braver, a mutual friend of Victor's and myself, uh, produces a show called Delusion every Halloween, which is a cross between a haunted house and a play. It's called hauntedplay.com. Victor is the first assistant director and creative director, and I do creature suits whenever I have the time for John. Well, I got an email from John one day on Victor's behalf with an image of a skinwalker that Victor liked and said, can you build this? I said, well, let me read the script. <laughs> when I found out that it was a found footage project, I was going to turn it down. But then I read the script and it was one of the three best scripts I'd read in the last 15 years. So I said, not only did I say yes, I made the creature effects for free, thus becoming an executive producer. The Monster Project was always going to be a found footage film. Uh, people ask me all the time, why is it why did you decide to make a found footage film out of the Monster Project when found footage is such a frowned upon genre? 
Personally, I always loved found foot, the found footage genre. I've always had a heart for it. And uh, it's just the way that I came up with the idea. The idea was never meant to be a, a, you know, a regular film. It was always, to me, in my own eyes uh, and vision, a found footage film. I thought that's what was interesting to it, and that's what I thought was so captivating and, and pumped it with adrenaline, was the fact that you were there in the middle of the action with those monsters. Back in 2013, found footage films were all about demons and not seeing those demons. There were so many of those same f movies that were coming out of the same found footage films that were following, following the same formula that I decided to do the exact opposite and create an action horror film where the monsters are in your face. <laughs> After we finished writing the script, we realized that the movie was bigger than we imagined, so it required a little bit more money, and on top of that, we had lost our primary location, which when that happened, when we lost our main location, which what the entire script was based off of, uh, that presented a whole new set of problems that we had to deal with, so we had to find a new location, um, and we had to raise more money because locations in Los Angeles are very expensive, and traveling outside of Los Angeles means lodging and expenses and travel expenses, in which we couldn't afford either. So. Uh, we were originally planning on, on doing it on a very tight shoestring budget and um, the fact that we lost that location really changed everything for us. I probably called every single person that I knew who could point me in the right path to find a location and eventually I stumbled upon this location uh, which was in the same district uh, that the first location was in. Uh, it's this massive mansion and unfortunately we didn't have the money to shoot in there at the time. Well, since we didn't have the money to shoot right away. We had a couple of years to think about things and to build things in my spare time. It was never, I never had it as a full-time job. It was always my night job or my weekend job. But like I said, this went on for two, two and a half years from its inception. So Victor and I could really feel out the creature effects that we wanted and made some changes. I even rebuilt the entire uh, Skinwalker suit once because the first one just turned out to be a little too bulky. Two part silicones, uh, part A, part B. Uh, this one is standard set, which is five minutes work time, 20 minutes to demold. And then this one is the extra fast set, which is 90 minutes work time, five minutes to demold. I live in Lake Arrowhead, which is a couple hours outside of Los Angeles. So we did Stephen's life cast in a hotel room, and the incline of a bathtub seemed about right for him to lay down while I made the mold of his face to make the prosthetics from. And if at any time during this you're uncomfortable, just pull it off. <laughs> okay. Nothing to worry about. And we just bought this towel. <laughs> <laughs> he was so comfortable with it, he fell asleep, so he was like sliding down and he had kind of molded him in a weird position. Get up a little more, Stephen. Oh. <laughs> Wake up. Steven. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Chin up. Chin up, old man. Uh, however, we needed the mold to make his uh, facial prosthetics for stage one and stage two. I actually sculpted the stage three on him as well, even though that wasn't really necessary because it was so large. Master yeah. first. <laughs> there you go. I felt like a transformation right there. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Steven Flores, who played the Skinwalker, was beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, he was perfect for the role to begin with. I had seen his movement work on Delusion, and I knew his look was perfect, you know, Native American to play the Skinwalker. But we glued two by four blocks to his feet to make him taller and to give him dog legs. And I thought he was going to have to rehearse for those for a couple of weeks before we could even do anything with him. I glued the blocks to his feet and he took off immediately like a fish to water. He was running all over the house, upstairs, downstairs, outside, inside. <laughs> it was kind of insane how natural he was for the part. I'm going to give your shins a serious you workout. You can understand how Geisha's yeah, walk, walk in the concrete, yeah. Okay, just to 
close up the feet like that. Yeah. What was that one this year? That hallway. The the maze, yeah. Right? You move into the maze, which would not be a maze, obviously. Right? And then you would turn, and right here, there's that window to the rooftop. And you lost that block there. Yeah, that's, that's, dude, that's exactly what we're going to strive for. You have to understand that when we came up with the idea for the Monster Projects, we were, I was straight out of college, Phil as well, we had no, I mean, we didn't have much money at all. We were, Brian, Phil's roommate, was living on, on, on a blow-up mattress. And we could barely afford rent. We would squeak by with a couple of random jobs towards the end of the month and have just enough. And luckily, you know, we were able to keep that going for a while. And so we just really kind of went for it. And that's what you have to do when you decide to make your first feature, is you, or any feature, is you really have to commit and you have to go for it. And that's exactly what we did. Unfortunately, circumstances happened and, and it delayed the start of production, but we were determined to make the film and to finish it. And that's how we also got through production, but especially through post-production to finish the film. And so we had a very hard time looking for investors because uh, we had a lot of investors that were promising us contracts and promising us uh, um, funding and those promises just kept falling through. And uh, that was until Corbin came along. Victor and I even just like bonded back in the day just watching horror films and, you know, eating Twixes. <laughs> <laughs> a small part of me definitely definitely had given up on this ever getting made just because we had been let down so many times. When time came for pre-production and getting everything rolling, I realized that there were definitely some downfalls to being a first-time filmmaker. One of the heartbreaking things that happened when our investors came on board was the fact that we had to lose some of our main actors that had been with us for about two and a half years. Uh, we lost Brian Jensen, who was going to play the lead role in The Monster Project, uh, who had done all the teasers and trailers and clips that we had shot throughout the Kickstarter phase and before the Kickstarter and after the Kickstarter, who had been become a, one of my best friends. I think, <laughs> you know, evil seeps through the cracks of society, you know, and I think it targets vulnerable people. I mean... There's documentation of exorcisms and stuff, so what's to say the what's to say the devil hasn't um, transcended in different ways? So it was a very heartbreaking uh, uh, moment and deal. We could either have Brian as our lead in this film, or not have the investment and not be able to make this film. And unfortunately, it was a hard decision that we had to make. And uh, we also had uh, lost Natalie Garcia, who was going to play our vampire, uh, who was also very talented and, and great for the role. Definitely not human. Um, not that I regret who the actors uh, ended up uh, uh, playing those parts, but um, it was at the time a difficult uh, phase for the Monster Project and for myself and the other people that were a part of the project. We started the casting process, I believe, a month and a half or a month before production. Uh, one of our investors uh, pushed for us to hire a casting agency, which we were uh, on the support of. But it took them a while to find the actors that I was looking for. And uh, we found uh, Yvonne Zima, I believe, a week and a half or two before shooting. But as for... Uh, Justin Bruning, who plays Devin, and Toby Hemingway, who plays Brian. Those guys didn't come on board until a week before we started shooting. It was that uh, close uh, to shooting. We were really, really stressed out and nervous. And so those, those actors kind of accepted the role, and a week later, if not days later, they were on set, and, and uh, we were going. So it was a very kind of last minute and stressful process hiring these new actors we had unfortunately another actor drop out his name was ryan surratt who was going to play devon originally and he had to drop out unfortunately due to some personal um uh matters and that was a, another heartbreaker for me as well since he was the perfect actor for the role and had, the role had been written for him and so i had to rethink the entire uh, character um, going into it which was uh, quite complicated as well just a lot of a lot of different things changed all throughout the pre-production phase as we were going into you know to film the film and it was just obstacles after obstacles that i uh, 
more so than most projects that I'd worked on uh, up until then. When we found the location, it was a wreck, which is exactly what I wanted. Uh, however, uh, a couple, as time passed uh, and a year and a half went by, when we were ready to shoot, we went back into the location and that location had changed a lot. It was painted all over the place. There was artwork and tagging and holes were ripped where you didn't want holes to, carpets were ripped. The basement had a eight foot deep grave that we had to cover up and we had to, the fact that we had no budget, we had to redress and repaint that entire mansion ourselves. Uh, with the help of some of our friends and so just just getting the location ready for the shoot was something that we had to undertake ourselves and uh, in the midst of pre-production. I hired a storyboard artist who uh, named Richard Rios who's very talented and, and we created boards for every single action scene, stunt scene, uh, scene that involved special effects. We He, he drew it all all of those scenes out on boards and it ended up uh, being very helpful. If you watch the film and you compare it to the storyboards, you'll see that, that it is almost identical to what uh, Richard and I had, had thought of and, and worked on. You know, being accomplished as we speak, and so we will have this entire room there, the black room in there. It's gonna be our storyboard room and I think after hangout, I don't know exactly but yet, but we'll have all the storyboards posted up there before we start shooting and we'll be able to see. Trust me, Shiori. Shiori, trust me. It's gonna be okay. feels like home being on set and directing and piecing everything together to create the vision that I have in my head and you know getting those images out of my head and getting them on the screen so we finally got to shooting the monster project and um, it was it was great it was, it was quite smooth the first week there were no special effects and no stunts so we were moving through it rather smoothly and rather quickly oh, hold up not so fast <laughs> Shit. And then we came around to the second week of shooting at the mansion where all the special effects and stunts starting, uh, started to happen. On, Steven, give me like a, this kind of like a, like a kind of a war or something. Oh yeah. If you're about to charge it. Cool. Did you get the stairs properly? Uh, you cut out, but I'm sure you're getting it. But I'm, but I can't. Just because I, can, I can't really get up there properly. I can't see no. anything. So this final one, so we do it again. You'll come in, do the same action, and then I'll say disappear. So you, you know, you'll, you'll just kind of exit this way. And then count to like, you know, six and then come back in <laughs> right right like do this and then i'll say turn and then you'll turn okay and then you'll go up To get a lot of people to say, oh, so you're you're used to it, you're stunt guy. Well, it's never really getting used to it. I have the guts to do it, but that doesn't mean I'm not like. Ah! 
I'm scared. I can't think about it. Yeah, that's the key. Just don't think about it. Just think, oh, okay, cool. We're gonna have some fun. We're gonna jump. But if you go, okay, I'm gonna do this. I gotta do it right, and I gotta not hurt myself. And then you, then you're done. You can't psych yourself out. We had anticipated the fact that stunts and special effects were going to take a lot of time, but regardless of that, we also knew that it was going to be a very uh, kind of quick and shoot kind of pace, just because we had a tight budget and we only did have uh, nine or ten days to shoot in the mansion. Everything that you see, all the stunts, all the special effects, all the action scenes, all of that, we shot in only ten days, which, if you're a filmmaker and you understand stunts and special effects, was a massive undertaking. So we didn't have much time to review the footage that we were shooting. We didn't have much time to rehearse. We just went and shot. And luckily we were very prepared uh, with storyboards and with our shot order and shot list and everything. We were very, we had planned everything out to the T. We're recording this of Victor running, doing the skinwalker thing just so that you have like lovely home videos. <laughs> he doesn't know though, so hopefully he finds this exhibit to you. So, so she'll be at number two already, but. Uh, Pass says on the rotation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He's a really good director, by the way. We unfortunately were forced to shoot in June and in Los Angeles in June that means that the sun sets at around 9 30 p.m. and the sun starts rising at around 4 45 a.m which left us with about eight hours or less, seven hours of full night, uh, nighttime uh, hours of shooting. So we're three hours in overtime. We can't, I mean, we have to let the crew know, it's up to them if they want to stay. We can't, Fine. We can't force them to stay. Everybody can go home aside from Jim, myself, and Phil. Now that I'm worn out. <laughs> All right, everybody. I've always cared about this, too. <laughs> because we were under budget constraints and we couldn't really afford to have that many stunt doubles. Uh, I took it upon myself to do a lot of the uh, stunt doubling for some of my lead actors, particularly the role of Brian, uh, played by Toby. I also didn't want him to get hurt. I'd say about 80% of the first person POV shots you see in the film are me running through the house. Phil also took it upon himself to double for Toby Hemingway and quite a few scenes as well. I'll try. That's a cut, Luke. Okay. Copy. scene that I'll, I'll never forget. And I think it's a trooper for doing, which is a scene where uh, Yvonne Zima and uh, the character of Brian are supposed to be crashing through the floorboards of uh, the third floor of the house into the second floor hallway. And uh, so that meant that we were going to suspend both of them, so Yvonne and uh, Phil in this case, on wires from the ceiling and drop them onto a pad at the same time simultaneously and and we got the shots and we had only one take to make it happen and we got it it was uh, quite amazing ready phil ready here we go aim up a bit phil three two one action oh damn i think we got it you guys okay I'm okay you guys all right yeah. okay, guys okay one of the craziest experiences of my life and totally worth it and I'm so glad I did that. Uh, so many of the scenes um, I had to get in a harness and put a wire on my back and try and stab Yvonne and then I got pulled and launched back and hit the pads and... And pull! <laughs> cool, I'm good. And, uh, and you know, did a, did a lot of, this, of those stunts and, and I have to say that doing those stunts ourselves was also something that I'll never forget that I, I, you know, I really enjoyed doing. The basement was our enemy. 
during the production of the film. It really was. We, at the end of each day, we would run down to the basement and try and capture just a couple minutes of that scene and we just kept failing to capture what we were trying to get. We were encountering issues with stunts, we were encountering issues with wardrobe, we were encountering issues with uh, makeup, just about anything you can imagine. The set was super dusty, no one could really breathe down there, people had to wear face masks or leave the set because it was too hard for breathe, to breathe. And um, or some of our actors would feel kind of faint. It was a very, very complicated scene to film. Stab her with the cross! I'll take those then. Thank you. All right. Man, I'm carrying four things at the same time. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Just you and I. Sure, you can stay on the other side. Yeah, we're still rolling. Okay, so let's see. We thought we had enough to just create some magic during editing, and we just didn't. So I remember Phil and I were sitting in front of the computer during editing, and I remember just both of us face planting our heads into our palms just simultaneously and just telling ourselves what are we going to do? How do we fix this? And so we came up collectively with this dream sequence that um, where Brian gets taken into Shuri's world and that ended up allowing us to remove stunts from that scene and, uh, and complete the scene properly with a really cool sequence. Get on the punk, yeah? All right, we'll see. Jamal, come closer this way. Cannon! In the end, though, the basement ended up being one of my favorite scenes, uh, especially with the dream sequence where I have my little cameo. Shooting in night vision is the biggest regret that I have working and directing the Matsu project. It's unfortunately took away a lot of the production value and vision that I had for the film. The biggest nightmare on the Monster Project was shooting it on night vision. <laughs> Something completely unexpected. Nobody expected what that stuff would do. It erases your paint job, so you basically have dead rubber. It also turned polyester fabric white, even if the fabric was indeed black. Skinwalker had white armpits and a white crotch, uh, as did uh, the demon at the very beginning on the roof. Yvonne's wardrobe went from black to white. Some of our demonic worship robes went from black to white or dark gray to white. The blood disappeared. Oh, Jamal, when Jamal became a skinwalker, he had one of the most beautifully blended makeups you've ever seen on Night vision, you can see exactly where the prosthetic is and his skin is a completely different color than the prosthetic. That was a constant question that Victor and I had leading up to production. We would go back and forth and we ended up doing traditional night vision, which caused more problems than it was worth. We didn't realize it while we were filming uh, because our monitors were functioning 15% of the time and we only had the money to afford those monitors. and. And uh, we knew something was strange was happening because we had noticed that uh, Yvonne's dress was turning white when it was black, uh, but we hadn't really noticed it on the special effects because anytime special effects uh, were being displayed on camera, it was during an action scene and things were so erratic and chaotic that uh, it was almost impossible to see what was going on. So we were moving so fast as well, mind you. We, we had 15 days to shoot the entire film, which means that when you're working with stunts and special effects, both two departments that take a lot of time to prepare and to execute, we were running around and just capturing whatever we could so we could finish our days on time. So we just had no idea what was going on and it ended up binding us back very hard when we sat down and started cutting the film in post-production. For example, Muriel, uh, as a vampire, she was drenched in blood from head to toe and she looked badass and terrifying. Unfortunately, in the film, uh, you can barely tell that she's wearing prosthetics in the first place uh, just because of the night vision. Just didn't capture the special effects. We reshot a lot of it. I would like to have reshot even more. We found uh, some, some money to go back and do two days of reshoots where we were able to reshoot some of the skinwalker scenes, but unfortunately 
some of the scenes uh, had to take a hit and, and remain the way they were because we didn't have the budget to reshoot them. And action! Give me one second. That's not here. Scene 49.50, Charlie, take one. Can we start from here? Uh, the night after we were finished with the reshoots, we all decided to go up to my house in Lake Arrowhead and use my yard for the scene in the woods. It wasn't even really a scripted scene. It's something Victor came up with later where when the skinwalker is chasing Brian outside of the house, he, we just added a lot of a chase scene. And it turned out, I'm, I'm glad we did because it turned out great. Steven, ready? Alright, go ahead and crash down. Alright, ready? And three, two, one, action! Shooting the film for me was just an absolute blast. I was there with some of my closest friends making the film that I'd been dying to make for three years. It was heaven for me in a way. Despite all the challenges and despite all the difficulties we were experiencing and dealing with, I think it was one of the happiest times of my life. It's a wrap on the Monster Project. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. It's still lit. <laughs> all right, great. Let's all get a cup. He went in my nose, too. <laughs> yeah, what do we want? I, I flipped champagne glass right here. <laughs> if you had been there, you would have seen all the Red Bulls that were on the editing table. I think that at some point we just decided to just keep them there to make a trophy out of them. We had about, I think, close to 60 or 70 Red Bulls just stacked on the editing table. Uh, we were running on that for fuel because we were working and editing just because we were so energetic and so passionate and excited to get this film cut. We were working on it probably about 20 hours a day. And... Um, it was editing with Phil is always, I think, my favorite part of the process. We were editing very fast and we had our cuts done, but the actual post-production process took about two years. This is part of the, uh, the extra features. Yeah, we're just kind of <laughs> recording a bit of everything. I use my own voice for a lot of the monsters in the film. <laughs> Over at the post house we were using, we had a couple sessions where we would just go behind the mic and I would just create all these noises and, and ADR the monsters and just basically run the scenes in full and just go crazy and you, you know, I, I would just, I lost my voice on multiple occasions, uh, just mimicking all the werewolf noises. See how, how cool does that sound? You hear that, John? I do hear it. <laughs> Yeah, gonna record a bunch of that. Due to the fact that we were shooting the film in such a traffic busy area in Los Angeles, we had traffic noises throughout practically all of our dialogue, which meant that we had to ADR uh, or re record a lot of our actors' dialogue. <laughs> Cool. Awesome.
Nice and nice, guys. We don't need to do that one again. Oh, God. The camera is on your forehead, so you should be close to the mic. Oh, Jamal and I got you a head strap camera so you can film yourself falling off your skateboard. Oh, but can't you do it? Less of a pause after yeah. the oh, yeah. <laughs> and you go. <laughs> is it uh, that's right, the next one? That's what I see. I'd say about 50% of the film was re-recorded and in post. Let's do one more. I'm gonna stand over here. When I do this, that means the scream has stopped, okay? Is this, uh, from what I recollect, is this where I'm holding you yes. like that? Correct. She so we're like this though, right? Yeah, she comes yeah. to you and she like kind of like hugs right, you like, this, like that. Right? Come on, Jamal! Jamal, come on! Move! Move! Even you think lower or the higher register is good? I think, I, I mean, the lower is going to give you a little bit creepier of a vibe. Right, okay. He promised that he would come here and talk to you. You'd leave. Looking for a distributor was a challenge all in itself. It, Phil and I searched for a while and we went to the American film market, the AFM, and different markets and talked to a bunch of producers and we literally had to force our foot through the door to get people to just watch the trailer that we had cut for the film, which was a very impressive trailer. And uh, every time we were able to get people to just look at the first 10 seconds, they'd watch the rest of it and then and we get their emails and their phone numbers and we would talk. But getting those conversations started was a challenge all in itself. That eventually led to us meeting Epic Pictures, who ended up being our distributor, and they really helped us market the film and creating the look for the marketing aspect of the film that ended up being the poster that you see and the trailer that you see and every other element that really uh, came uh, with the marketing of the film and they were able to 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 respect the vision that we that i had created for the film and and displayed properly through all these marketing aspects which which really pleased me throughout the process and i think reflected the film very uh, very well it was the number one trailer on IMDb during the release of our film. The Monster Project was downloaded close to a million times, if not more, illegally. Um, now you're talking for independent filmmakers like us, uh, that's a huge loss of revenue. I'm happy with the film. I think if we had shot it a little sooner and a little tighter, it might have been closer to what we all envisioned five years before. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very happy with it and uh, my family and friends are all very complimentary of it. It's the hardest thing that I've ever done and I'm sure anybody that took part in this would agree, but it is also one of the most fulfilling things that I've done. And no matter what, our film's out there and I hope you enjoyed it. If there's one thing that I learned making the Monster Project, it's that if you have an idea, go out there and make it and don't wait. We waited for a while for the Monster Project and I think that because the time passed, we had a lot of obstacles coming our way. If you have an idea, go out there and do it. Execute it, make it happen, and don't wait. In the end, the Monster Project is a film that I'm extremely proud of and everybody else that was a part of it should be proud of it as well.